Hello, this is Gary Auden, and I'm bringing you an Educast. The DSP makes the conference call, it's sponsored by Revo Labs and Telecom Reseller. On the call today with me is Randy Lee, Director of Marketing for Revo Labs. And I've done several of these Educasts with Revo Labs, and we always try and provide some good educational information. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. We're talking about the digital signal processor. What is it? Why is it in the ro what its role in the audio conferencing technologies? What functionality do we have in the DSP? And the fourth bullet is real important. The DSP has to be programmed to deal with echo cancellation, gain control, mixing, gating, a whole number of factors that are not typical to the cell phone, but are typical to the collaboration technologies. And then how do you scale this into audio conferencing solutions? So let's start off, Randy, with just give us some background. What's a DSP and why is it important in this environment? Well, if you do a Google search on digital signal processor or DSP, it's generally a specialized microprocessor uh, that optimizes circuitry to process analog signals. Now, these analog signals aren't necessarily just speech, so that's what we're concentrating on today. It could be something from radar signals and sonar signals in the military application to processing photos and videos for face capture uh, and applications like that. So digital signal processing is a very mathematics intensive field using uh, processing on a variety of these different input signals. A DSP can also refer to a dedicated appliance that performs these same functions, though usually DSPs are referred to as, as the chips themselves. And they have superior efficiency in running these mathematical algorithms that make them a sort of a turbocharger uh, on top of what you might see of a generalized microprocessor. So it seems possible that a typical microprocessor could do this work, but much less efficiently and take a lot more processing power to do the job. Is that correct? That's correct. The DSP will allow you to have a reduced chipset or maybe use a lower cost processor in your design and specifically allow you to do your digital signal processing in a, on a secondary channel. Now, we're talking about collaboration. And collaboration is people getting together to do things. Let's talk about collaboration, and then we'll talk about how the DSP fits into that environment. Sure. You know, it sounds easy to call a meeting, but there's actually very many things that you have to think about and consider and plan for. And most people take it as second nature when they're calling a meeting, but when you think about it, you know, number one is, what is this meeting for? What's the purpose and the goals of, of the output of this meeting for the attendees? Where is it going to be held? Uh, what is the meeting space going to look like? Is it going to be an interior room with everyone in that room? Is it going to be online with remote people coming online as well? Will people be at their office desks, their home offices, or will they be actually coming in on their mobile phones? And then how are they going to engage? Is it going to be just an audio call where people share information via speech? Or is there going to be a video aspect so you can see each other uh, and maybe do some screen sharing and data sharing uh, with applications online like an Excel spreadsheet or a PowerPoint uh, or an electronic whiteboard in the room which will again get displayed on your screen. Will there be any collaboration uh, and online editing during that, uh, during that meeting experience? And then you have to look at the peripherals. Are you going to need uh, microphones and speakers? Obviously for audio those are going to be required, but will you also need a video camera for a room or for individuals? Will you need a recording device if you're going to uh, be recording this meeting in an offline fashion that you can share and, and post later? And then last is the selection of the services and setting up the meeting appointment. Now that uh, may seem like a simple part, but many companies have multiple services that you can choose from. It might be a go-to meeting. They might be using Skype for Business as their standard office communications package. They might have a VoIP system for doing audio calls. You may have to bridge calls together. So it's one of those things that that when you're planning a meeting, people take this all in, uh, under consideration. They've done it for many times, but here are the elements that are needed for each of these meetings. I would think one of the things that you had didn't say the word, but the word flexibility and how you set this up is extremely important. Yes, it is, because what you're looking for is of all the elements that you need to have in this meeting, you know, again, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be sharing uh, data, are you going to be editing things online, or is it just a lecture and presentation type of application, such as this Educast? 
you have to say, what are the things that I need for it? Um, you have to choose your location. You have to choose the lo where you're going to be when doing these things and the time. You're going to have to choose your communication channels, uh, whether you're going to be doing just audio or visual as well or digital. Will you be recording or not? And as you look through all these elements, you have to say to yourself, really, what is the most important aspect of a meeting? Most people consider video to be the number one important aspect of any meeting. But really, it is secondary to audio. You know, have you ever held a meeting where audio did not take place? Well, I have, and typically they just get canceled right away because no one can communicate. So audio really is the bedrock of all meeting foundations. Let's move forward. We are going to talk about the digital signal processor. Let's discuss its role in the conferencing collaboration technologies. You know, most people think audio is easy, right? All you need is a microphone and a speaker. Well, that is a, a wrong analysis. What you have to do in, a, in an audio environment is collect all the speakers' voices in a location and send them to desired endpoints and make them intelligible. You've got to reduce your noise. You've got to reduce your echo. Uh, and, and you've got to make this really sound well so everyone can hear. Your endpoints may be through a network. For instance, you may go to a, a, a Dante appliance or an AVB appliance on the far end uh, as a cell phone. You may go through a conference system or appliance such as a Cisco uh, telepresence solution. Or you may just send the signal locally to an amplifier. Now, the DSP is there really to manage all the audio. And if you look on the left, I'm sorry, on the right hand of your screen, you'll see a Yamaha MRX-70 circle there in the center. And what you're seeing is a typical DSP integration within a room. In that diagram, you'll see eight wireless microphones uh, on a table connected wirelessly to an executive elite system, which can either put each of the microphone signals directly into the DSP, or they can be output through uh, an AVB switch over Ethernet uh, into the MRX-70 for processing, to the DSP for processing. So that's all your microphone inputs. Then you've also got to direct where is the signal going to go. You might send the signal to an amplifier and then to room speakers or a voice uplift application. Or you may send this directly out uh, through a network to a conference system uh, out to multiple far ends for a remote collaboration uh, online collaboration, and this is how you're processing your audio through that system. The DSP has to deliver the audio to the endpoints, but it has to deal with a lot of other distractions within the room. And that's what I'm, I'm looking at in the general problems with audio diagram on the left side. Not only is a person speaking directly into a microphone, but his voice is also bouncing off walls in the room and being picked up by the microphone as an echo with a time delay. The speaker from the uh, speakerphone itself is also putting audio out into the room, which is going to be directed and caught by the microphone and bounce off the room itself, and there's going to be a lot of noise in that room. And all these things the DSP has to deal with to clean up the signal and make speech intelligible on the far end. I think that brings up the first slide of the technical discussion we have, and that you've mentioned echo cancellation. And I know that in certain rooms, when I hear echoes, it distracts me from understanding what's being said. Would you delve into that, please? Sure. Now, as we go through the next few slides, uh, what I'm trying to do is give you, the audience, some criteria for selecting systems uh, and developing some metrics, perhaps, with which you could compare different solutions uh, to come up with a great solution for your audio space. Now, there's really two types of echoes that, we have, that the DSP has to deal with, those within a room and those across the electronic channel. Within a room, let's take a voice reinforcement application, and that's on the upper left diagram where it says feedback loop. Now, the microphone, this is a voice reinforcement application, so you've got someone speaking into a microphone, which is then picked up, uh, put through the mixer, sent to an amplifier, and amplified in the room. An example of this might be a lecture hall, uh, with a, a lecturer up in front, or it could be a house of worship with a pastor up on the uh, up on his uh, stage, talking into his microphone. The microphone can pick up that amplified speaker's voice and tr transmit that again through the system, louder and louder. And that's the aspect of what feedback is. 
Now these rooms also may have their own harmonics and resonances. So a specific tone can resonate or reverberate in that room and get, again, amplified within that feedback loop. I mean, have you ever seen a lecturer in an auditorium uh, or a pastor in a church come forward towards the audience and all of a sudden you hear this loud tone get louder and louder until that person steps back away from the front of the stage? Well, that person's come far forward far enough to be within the output area of the loudspeakers, and that's what's happening is you're getting that feedback where they're just getting... Um, more and more amplification through that channel. They stop talking, they step back, and that goes away. Now across an electronic channel, like a phone call, have you ever heard your own voice echo in your ear during a call? Well, the problem isn't on your end, it's on the other end, what we call the far end. You're on the near end, and they're on the far end. What's happening is what you can see in the diagram on the lower left. Person A, is speaking within the microphone and that's transmitted to the output to a speaker in the area where client B is. Well that client B is speaking being caught by the microphone and sent back to client A but also the voice that's coming out of that microphone, I'm sorry, out of the speaker is being caught by the microphone and also amplified back. And that's the echo that you're hearing. There's a small time delay because you, there's a certain fixed amount of time required to, for client A's voice to get in the microphone, get through the system, and be played back on the far end. And then that gets captured and played back to the near end. So it's not your problem, it's really echo is a problem with the, with the other person on the far end. So how do you get rid of it? Well, what you need to do, and what the systems do, is that on the lower right side of this, uh, lower right diagram, what you actually do is you take a, a portion of that noise, you, you monitor the signal from client A coming through, and the digital signal processor takes all the microphone signals from client B and also from the loudspeaker in that, in that room and all that stuff being played back, and it will track and digitally subtract the voice of client A from the return signal uh, back to client A from client B. So you're subtracting that information, that speech being played out in the far end from being played back uh, and, and returned to client A. And not only do these algorithms have to take into account the direct path from the speaker uh, to the microphone being fed back, but also within the room itself has reverberations. And especially with today's glass wall conference rooms, um, the hard surfaces, not there's a lot of reflection in these rooms, so you have an echo that is, again, is time delayed, and so you need to subtract not only the primary loudspeaker signal, but all the echoes within the room. And you can see that as you start looking at, at the longer and longer time delays, the more advanced and complicated the algorithm has to be to remove that echo, and it can take some really some prodigious processing power to do that. I'd like to move on to the next subject, and you use the word gain control for the audience. Does that mean volume control? Yes, it does. It's not just volume control on the playback side on your side, but it's the input volume that you hear into the uh, or the playback on the far end on the loudspeakers. Really what you're trying to do is compensate for differences between people speaking in a room and their, their relative volume levels and the microphones uh, as well as how far away they are from the microphones. The farther you are away from a microphone, of course, the lower your voice is going to be. So in this simple diagram, I show one person speaking very loudly, hello, and another one speaking very softly, hi, in the same room, uh, being picked up by two different microphones. What you want your, your gain control system to do, your, your AGC system, is to, is to diminish the signal of the loudspeaker and increase the signal of the soft speaker so that they all come out approximately at the same volume level on the far end when that's played out. Now that moves into the next comment. You're using two words here, mixing and gating. Let's introduce those and then spend a couple of slides on each one. Sure. Sometimes uh, these use the words interchangeably, but they're actually two different functions. And we'll get into each of those functions in the next two slides. But what I wanted to show you uh, that this typical example of a, of a setup of an integrated room where you're going to be doing mixing and gating. Now these mixing and gating functions control from by the DSP controls 
where the output signals go to and which microphones are active at any one given time. In this example, what we've got in the center of the screen here is actually the back view of a DSP with all the multiple connections into it. You've got four wireless microphones feeding into a wireless uh, base unit which sits right above the DSP in this diagram. You've got two wired microphones feeding directly into the DSP. These might be for fixed locations such as a podium uh, or a, a specific desk. You might have an auxiliary input where a uh, a DVD player might be uh, playing some video for part of the meeting presentation. And then the outputs may be going to an amplifier, uh, in a local amplifier to be played in ceiling speakers. You may have an output to a conference system through auxiliary jacks uh, you know, into a dedicated appliance or a conferencing system. Or it may go out to a network switch where you've got uh, connections via you know, standard digital PC, laptop type of applications such as this, uh, GoToMeeting uh, or, or other type of webinars that are, are ac uh, applications that are out there. Let's go into the word mixing now in some detail. Sure. Now mixing is really defining which mics, which microphones are sending signals through the DSP uh, to specific output channels. Now mixing is always involved with the incoming mic signals. You can combine the signals or you can keep them separate. For example, in a collaboration meeting, you would likely want to take all the input mics in a room and send it to one outgoing signal to the far end. Yet in a recording application, you might want to keep the mics separate to record the inputs independently. For instance, in a lecture recording application, you may want to have the lecturer come in and record on one channel and then maybe crowd questions with a handheld mic coming in on a separate channel recorded separately. So in this example, what you're seeing, uh, these three talking heads are participating in an online meeting. And what you've got is all three are talking during this meeting and they're all coming in, processed through an algorithm and summed to single output channels. And in this case, they were sending the signal off to the VoIP network through an internal VoIP, say an online on-premise PBX system but also digitally through an AVB switch to maybe some people who are connecting via audio on their PC uh, running a meeting such as uh, Google Chrome for Meetings or Skype for Business Meetings. But what's not being sent is we're not sending it out to the local ceiling speaker. Uh, there's no reason, this is a small room, so there's no reason to amplify within the room. So this is the mixing. This is where we've defined all three mics, in this case, to go to the, the VoIP network and the AV, AVB switch output. Now I look at the word gating and it sounds like that's complementary to mixing rather than competitive. Is that correct? That's correct. It really is a, a separate function. And what that uh, system does, what the DSP will do is decide which mics are actively transmitting at any one given time. And again, we're taking the, the same room, but let's say only one person is speaking. Maybe they're, they're giving a presentation and showing some of the, the details of a new product, let's say. Speaker number one is just silent, and then maybe speaker number three is creating noise by typing, by crinkling paper, maybe whispering. Uh, you know, there are many ways to create noise. So in this case, an, an auto mixer and an auto will have a gating function that will attenuate or even turn off microphones number one and three because it's not finding any speech coming in on that channel and only channel two will be transmitted. So gating is usually a local function of the DSP which tells, uh, which will turn mics off and on independently during a collaboration meeting. Now there are, you know, you say, well how can algorithms determine what speech is? Well actually it, it's a well-known uh, mathematical theory and, and background where you can determine, without going into details, the mathematics of a power spectrum analysis and say, all right, this microphone has speech and this microphone has noise. There is a uh, Yamaha, our parent company, has a specific algorithm they call Human Voice Activity Detection, or HVAD, uh, which does exactly that and will gate speakers off, uh, I'm sorry, gate microphones off when they're not detecting any human speech coming in on that channel. Would you now go through some example of that? Yeah, sure. 
let's take this one. Uh, it's a very simple one. It was just looking at sound reinforcement within a room. Maybe you have a large room or a large multi-purpose room. So you've got tables with microphones set up, and then you've got ceiling speakers in zones throughout this large area. Uh, for instance, we did a, a, an installation in the, the new Big Ten Conference Center, which has this sort of setup. They needed the voice reinforcement so everyone could hear within a room what everyone was saying. So what they did was create zones. And they had microphones set up so that, that be within a certain zone that when people were speaking within that microphone, it would be amplified by other speakers and other, I'm sorry, loudspeakers and other zones, such as we're saying here, zone one, the speaker is, is coming in, being amplified out to zone two, but it is not brought out to zone one to prevent feedback. Likewise, people speaking in zone two will come out on the ceiling loudspeaker in zone one, but not in their own area, again, to prevent feedback. And this is called a mix minus configuration for voice uplift. This might get very complicated. You might find that as they roll out the room divider walls, you now need to take those zones in the entire room, and then you have zones in each of these specific areas of a divided room. The DSP has to have that capability to take multiple speakers, again, mix them into the right output zones, and gate the ones that uh, are either creating noise or are inactive. Now, another subject that comes up, and these are two new words for us to discuss, are the words encoder and decoder. What, what do they do and why are they important? Well, if we look at the history of telephony, it really started with analog signals over analog lines, and then moved to digital transmission for cleaner signal transmission, and also being able to send many more calls over wires through these, this coding and multiplexing. What you're trying to do as you, as you go to a digital, besides getting a cleaner signal, uh, is that you can also make it secure. You can encode it with uh, algorithms that uh, encrypt the bit streams so that no one can decode them and figure out what you're talking about. The ultimate goal of any telephony system, any audio communication system, is to provide clear, intelligible audio with enough volume for people to hear uh, on both ends. Telephony started with analog signals and then moved to digital for cleaner signal transmission and being able to send many more calls over the wires through coding and multiplexing. Coding into a digital signal allows you a secure stream. You can encrypt it and keep people from listening in. You can reduce the bandwidth that's required to transmit the signal so you can fit more signals over a given uh, uh, transmission channel and will be put into standard industry formats so that both far end and near end can encode and decode that signal. But ultimately, speech is an analog signal. So as you look at it, an encoder and a decoder and a decoder, or what's known as a codec, you're taking an analog signal, converting it to digital, send it out through the channel, and then on the far end, it will be taken in, decoded, and put back into an analog version so that people can hear it. Uh, one of the things that I think is important is a lot of people think of the word codec as something generic, but there's a wide variation of quality and delay for codecs. Can you go into that, please? Sure. First, a little bit of history before we go into the description of some of these codecs and bit rates and quality. A lot of us remember rotary dial phones uh, from our early childhood. Those phones had low bandwidth. Human speech generally runs from the low hertz range up to about 8 kilohertz and maybe 14 kilohertz for some of the, the higher frequency tones in speech. Early phones were bandwidth limited to 3.5 kilohertz. And so they lost a lot of the high tones. For instance, you could barely hear the difference between F and S or V, B, and D. Intelligibility suffered. And that's actually why military developed some code names for letters. You know, who hasn't heard Alpha, Echo, Foxtrot, or things like that. That was so that people would make no mistakes on the other end of what letter was being spelled for comprehension. As they went to digital, uh, they were able to capture it, but it was still audio limited to that 3.5 kilohertz range on the endpoints until they started adding in what's called wideband audio, and they increased the bandwidth out to 8 kilohertz. 
And then lately you hear ultra-wideband, where it actually goes out to 16 kilohertz and really captures the entire range of all pre uh, speech frequency spectra power. But what that has meant is that as they increase the bandwidth and they increase the, the sampling rate to do that, it increases the bit rate. And that means that you've got more and more data you have to transmit over, over the data paths and you become bandwidth limited or you, you have capacity issues. So what do people do? They write new codecs, right? As you're squeezing more and more data, audio data, and then you add video on top of that, and then you add data sharing on top of that, you can quickly overwhelm a typical data channel. So what you do start doing is, is coding and decoding it to squeeze more data across an existing channel without having to upgrade that channel. Now you develop a new codec. So if you look at this diagram, what you see here on this diagram is the delay in, in these codecs that are listed uh, going downward from zero all the way down to two, up to 200 milliseconds at the bottom, and then the bit rate that's required through the channel itself. You'll see that some of the older standards, like MP3, which is, is years old now, had a long delay, but for a playback application, that was perfectly fine. But as you're going into speech and you're trying to get back and forth uh, bi-directional communication uh, in real time, you have to squeeze that time delay down. And so newer and newer codecs were developed to service lower delay, higher bandwidth, higher quality speech. And that's what you're seeing in this diagram. And the latest one that's, that's been proposed and is starting to proliferate is called Opus. And that seems to be a very robust and high capacity algorithm for all types of different data transmissions, especially related to speech with very low latency uh, and very high bandwidth that gives you great quality audio and video. The exact output signal that the DSP generates does depend on the application, the channel for the communications, the desired output streams, whether you're going to go to a recorder, let's say, or to a hardware endpoint, uh, a continent away. But what happens during a call setup is the endpoint electronics actually interrogate each other to agree on the codec to be used, especially if it's not a dedicated channel. And then once they set that up, that's when the conference actually starts. And all this happens invisibly to the users, but it's an incredibly fast and robust system to set up your communication channel to allow you the best possible audio and video signals across this channel during your collaboration. Now, we've covered a lot of different things, but I gather there's still some other functions that DSP has to perform. In any environment, there's always noise. I can even hear it in the room I'm recording in right now. I can hear HVAC noise coming in. There can be noise from outside the room. It can be uh, noise from actually ballast for your fluorescent lights. You can get trans sound transmitted through the wall, uh, through the windows everything. And what you want to do is to have a clean signal on the far end is remove that noise. You don't want to amplify it. You just want to take the speech and, and send that over to the far end without any other noise. Now you can do that digitally through the DSP, but there are also some room treatments that you can do uh, to do better sound absorption and lower reflections within the room uh, to help the overall environment. Now the next function is actually counterintuitive, noise fill. And what that does is the DSP can actually inject noise into a signal. And the reason is, have you ever been on a call when someone stops speaking and it gets really quiet and you think you're disconnected? It's happened to me before, certainly. So what the DSP does, it injects a little bit of background noise so that you can hear they're still connected on the far end. Uh, because there's actually, it's, it, it becomes different and difficult to know if you're disconnected or not. If they put it on mute or if they uh, have just stopped talking, you don't want to hang up on a signal when you're actually still connected and they're just being quiet. And then the last function of a, well, I shouldn't say the last, but in a, one of the other functions of a DSP is to be able to do local uh, and remote control of your microphone as well as your speaker system. And I just show a little control panel of one of our systems here on the lower left. But you want to be able, uh, for example, an AVIT department may be a managed service provider. 
and they may want to choreograph a meeting from a control room. So, for example, you might get a large global company uh, that wants to make a quarterly results announcement simultaneously to their offices in New York City, London, and Tokyo, and, and who knows where else. So the AV IT department can set up uh, a call so that they've got everyone online. They're actually able to monitor and control the microphones in all the rooms and all the other buildings. They can mute every other building uh, and every other continent and have just the CEO's mic active. And so while he speaks and gives the, gives the news, maybe transferred over to the CFO and he gives his news, then he opens it up for questions. And then the control room can say, all right, I'm going to open up Tokyo now. And the Tokyo people can ask questions. And then he can open up London. And then he can open up uh, Berlin or wherever the other remote offices are. So the, the DSPs can allow local and remote control of your microphones and also your speakers. That brings me up to the next question, and that's the word scaling. And you use two words here, embedded and discrete unit. And we see the huddle room is the very small end, and then we have the, the sort of uh, the large conference facility. Would you uh, focus on those two for us? Generally, the more microphones you have and the more number, the higher number of audio inputs and outputs, the more processing hot horsepower you need. In this simple diagram, really what you're looking at for larger room sizes and more participants, the cost and complexity of your solution will tend to rise. Your easiest solution, your mobile solution, uh, might be you know a portable USB phone or something like that that you can carry around in your backpack uh, through your office and huddle room and even your small conference rooms. You can generally service with conference phones. But as you get to the larger numbers, where you've got uh, you know eight microphones, ten microphones, twelve microphones, and you've got ceiling speakers and other stuff, you generally will have to have a separate appliance to run the DSP processing for that. So when I say embedded on the low end, you look at these phones that are out there, they all have the DSPs embedded within the phone. You know, so it's brought in as a chip and it's programmed uh, and it sits independent within the phone uh, that you're purchased and sitting, and sitting on your desk. As you get to these larger units, uh, it tends to be too many inputs and outputs it needs more processing horsepower, a larger circuit board, let's say, more uh, heat sink capability that will quickly overmatch the capability of a standalone phone or a small, you know, a smaller embedded DSP. And that's when you need an installed solution. So that becomes a discrete unit. You actually buy a DSP as a separate unit. Now that DSP may have telephony capabilities in it, so you can hook up directly to your VoIP system. It may actually be part of a, a video conference appliance but it becomes a, a separate subsystem that you need to purchase as part of the overall solution to handle all of the uh, multiple inputs and outputs that are needed. Again, the, the more IOs, uh, the more microphones, the more horsepower you needed, the bigger the box. What it seems to be is that you have a whole product line that starts off with that single small embedded all the way up to the big discrete units. We really have a complete suite of solutions for a full range of, of applications and environments. On the lower end, like we have already discussed, we have multiple styles of conference phones with multiple connectivity options and capabilities. You can hook up via a VoIP uh, system. You can hook up with a USB connection. We have analog inputs and outputs. We've got Bluetooth uh, with NFC connectivity as well. And all those have embedded echo cancellation, and DSPs to handle all the signal process. As you get larger and you start moving up this line, you start seeing uh, our wireless mic system up top. And then you also have the digital signal processor sitting there with it uh, to be able to handle the, the multiple inputs and outputs in a room. Now, Yamaha bought Revo Labs about two and a half years ago. And what we've done is combined our technical resources for solutions to all the collaboration spaces that are needed. And we combine the, the superb audio engineering practices of Yamaha and Revo Labs to make all these solutions available in a software agnostic environment. So you can take our solutions and, and plug them in with multiple uh, VoIP solutions, multiple IP PBXs, and they're compatible with Google Chrome for Meetings, Skype for Business, and multiple other 
uh, UCC applications like Zoom and video and BlueJeans. Yeah, I noticed that we have some information here for contact consultations and questions. I'd also like to point out this very good article, Why Sound Matters. And if you really think about it, without proper sound, everything else tends to fail. Well, I'd like to thank you very much, Randy, for your time and for those who viewed at the Educast.